Uh, good evening, everyone, one of you. A setting problem motivation, which three, consists of three parts. Okay, just a, a little bit of a maybe a little digression. Say making prostrations, I would suggest that um, if you feel the same, the, those of us who already, who already uh, follow the teachings of the Buddha more in the form of a practice, and then there may be some, um, say, the, what is the Buddha's teaching like? What, is, what it is like that my friends, what they are doing? Okay, so that way you might have some interest. So the point is that, that the finding what practice to do, that is entirely up to the individual. So meanwhile, uh, the point is that the, there must be a sense of openness. And of course, all of us who come here, if you feel that you are a follower of the Buddha's teaching, that is one thing. Otherwise, those of us who come here, no doubt that you came here with a sense of openness. That is so important, having a sense of openness. Now, um, should we say, should we practice? I come to sense that some of my friends, when they do the practice, the very small things, very small things can make a whole difference in a practice. And so this is more talking from my own personal uh, point of view, personal, say, the life experience point of view. I say the setting a proper motivation. When we set the proper mo motivation, then you're thinking. Just inclusion of this small, the, let's say, the uh, thinking pattern within this practice will make the whole difference in terms of the, the whole purpose of the uh, the transformation of one's mind, the dharma is to transform one's mind, and the transformation can take at such a great pace if you um, include a specific, say, the visualization, thinking, uh, that is very important. So therefore, yesterday I was talking about the, uh, the chanting and so forth, where the visualization wisdom of emptiness experience, bodhicitta motivation. So these will make the whole difference. So likewise, say making the, if um, they say, if you really feel yourself as I'm a practitioner, a, practice, a practicing Buddhist, there mornings you get up and then make three prostrations or seven prostrations. Then night, before you go to bed, again make like three prostrations, seven prostrations. Usually, this is not my style of teaching. Usually, I say the, I say this is a very different audience. Otherwise, say in the, the institutions such as universities, colleges, and so forth, is only just a very pure intellectual inquiry, which I delve into, so that the, the people, they will get a flavor of what the Buddha's teaching is. And whereas in this kind of setting, where the, it is primarily organized by the ABC and already a very established institution and the Dharma Center and so many people associate with that. So for that matter, um, the, so some form of my personal, say, the, the take, my personal uh, practice, these things, uh, i like to the, share with you so that if you can likewise follow that, it will make the whole difference. So the point is, when you make prostrations, say we make uh, three prostrations, and it's not necessary that you have to make it three. You can make it seven, ten, but, and some people, they make it like 20, 100 times in the morning, so forth. But just that, see to yourself whether you have time, and if you know of time, at least three, three prostrations sits, uh, they would be very good. And then while making prostrations, to see what is the benefit. Finally, there must be the benefit. If there's no benefit, then of course the physical exercise is one thing, right? And then the, in terms of the benefit, accumulation merit, and then more importantly, I personally would say, is the transformation taking place within your mind transformation where at the same over time you become a happier person over time as you age as you age uh, the tendency is that the for example say when you go out you see so many young boys and girls there 
And then the tendency is that after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they'll become old. This is what is bound to happen. Now the point is that as one ages, as one ages, if you become happier, 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 this is the indication that you are a Dharma practitioner. As you age, then you tend to miss your youth. Then you feel yourself, okay, the, say you reach age 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, you miss your youth, and you feel lonely, which means that they, even though, and then if you're not a Dhamma practitioner, that is one thing, that is a different matter, but if you think that you're a Dhamma practitioner, then something is wrong there. So for that matter, then they make sure that whatever Dhamma practice that we do, we do it in such a productive way, such a, say, the careful way, that eventually when you uh, actually, uh, say, the become a little older, five years older, 10 years older, 20 years older, you become, every time, you become happier and happier and happier person. So if this happens, this is a clear indication that you are a genuine Dharma practitioner, no matter what qualification other may say they see you as or see you to be, but you are a genuine deep practitioner. Well, this is what we need to keep in mind. So now the point is what to include in this kind of practice, say making prostrations, the chanting, and then the recitation, so forth. Say the what to include is the setting up proper motivation. So we always do with three things. One is refuge field. Number two is bodhicitta field. Number three is be mindful of the purpose of the practice. So these three things are not to be missed. Now for the refuge field, refuge field, some people they do very complicated refuge field with all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the different lineages and so forth. That's amazing. If you can do that, Wonderful. But if you, if you cannot do that, somehow you come to realize that there are people who are doing that, and then you may feel that I'm lacking behind something. That is not to worry about. What is important is refuge field. There are so many versions. One, very sophisticated versions, to the very simplest one, just um, the single gem refuge field. Single gem refuge field means, say, just visualize Buddha Shakyamuni. Or just visualize your root guru. And root guru, uh, not because that, oh, I just chose that person as root guru. No. For the, the purpose, for the, the purpose that this is a figure who embodies Buddha Shakyamuni. This is a figure who is the inspiration, um, inspiration to me in terms of the bodhicitta, in terms of me, the wisdom of emptiness. So this is what um, the, we need to keep in mind. So the, for the, the purpose of this the, the class, the, for the refuge visualization, let us visualize Buddha Shakyaman in front of us and His Holiness the Dalai Lama and your respective teachers in your mind. <clears throat> and then the next point is how to visualize them. That makes the whole difference. What to visualize and how to visualize. How to visualize is Visualize them, the Buddha, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and your teacher, and all the enlightened beings, like Arunigarjuna, and then the Lama Tsongkhapa, and the Guru Padma Sambhava, and then such these, such in Kunga Nyingbo, then the Jizun Tilupa, Jizun Narupa, Jizun Marpa, Jizun Mila, all these great teachers, and then so many great teachers from the Chinese tradition. So they are all. They are highly enlightened on the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. We visualize them. And how we visualize them? Number two, that is that visualize, we visualize them like a very affectionate parents. That is so important. Number two, that they are like very affectionate parents. And imagine that you are just sitting, you are so demoralized, and your parents are there. If you are just right in front of parents, then your parents will be so loving, caring, to embrace you with total love, affection, so forth. This is exactly how the Buddhist Bodhisattvas should be visualized as so loving and affection embracing. And the Bodhisattva field, visualize your two parents on the two sides. 
Okay, nowadays, the younger generation, there's a little complication there. Say the, the friction between the children and the parents. If this is the case with you, what I would suggest is that what we're studying here is we're trying to finally transcend the ordinary way of thinking. Ordinary, what's the ordinary way of thinking? Ordinary way of thinking is marked by, uh, say, a, f a feeling of, uh, say, the friction. The moment you feel disagreement with, between, with someone, say you feel dis the disagreement with your parents, instantly there's a friction happening. This is a mark of the ordinariness. Now we are trying to trans the, transcend the ordinary people's thinking, so where differences are bound to be there, and then yet you're not going to be affected by this. Easily being affected, this is the indication of uh, being, let's say, the ordinary being. So evolved practitioner, a real practitioner, a mark of a practitioner is that external factors should not affect us as much. So the least, the less you are affected by external factors, more evolved you are. So with that in mind, let us visualize your two parents on the two sides, and all the family members, including your children, and all the ascension beings, everyone here in Singapore, everyone in the world, everyone in the entire universe, the entire Milky Way galaxy, and everywhere one in the entire universe. And again, how you visualize them? They are like a very, here you are the mother, and all others are like your children, so destitute, so desperate, and being afflicted by the, say, the, the mental, the demons, afflictions, and so forth. So they are like a very extremely, say, the, the greatly, greatly pained, and uh, in the sick children. And with tremendous compassion towards them, just invoke the spirit of compassion to us all. Number three, the purpose of this practice. This is so important. Purpose of this class and the purpose of this practice is to uncover the ultimate treasure of happiness that exists within each one of us. In fact, whether you're Buddhist or not, this is not the point. Every one of you, each one of us, each one of us, we have the ultimate treasure of happiness, which is also known as the Buddha nature, the Dhagata Garbha. It is not that only if you are a Buddhist you have this Buddha nature, otherwise you don't have it. This is not true. Everyone, whether you're Buddhists, Hindus, Christians, Muslims, Jains, Jews, the Baha'i, or the Zoroastrian, the, the Parsi, or non-believers, everyone has this, this seed of perfection within. That is known as the Buddha nature. That is the air. Unfortunately, it is like the gold mixed with the soil. When the, the gold is mixed with the soil, ordinary beings cannot see the gold inside the air. Whereas the, the gold experts can see the gold there. Likewise, we, despite we having, each one of us, we having this, the seed of perfection within us, but why it is not evident is because that is being soiled, that is being mixed, mingled with the mental defilement. So therefore the glow is not taking place. So the, in the eyes of, just as in the eyes of the gold experts, this is the gold inside this mixture of the golden soil. Likewise, the, in the eyes of the, the enlightened beings, every sentient being, each one of us, is so precious, you have the incredibly precious Buddha nature within each one of us. So this is what all the Buddhist Bodhisattvas, they are seeing it. Yet, the Buddhist Bodhisattvas, they have it already manifested, and in our case, although it is there, like the soil obscuring this gold inside, gold inside likewise this Buddha nature is obscured by the mental defilements. And how to get rid of these mental defilements? That to know to do that, to remove the metal defilements and to let this gold like diamond like the treasure within each one of us to manifest. We need to know the nature of the mental defilements. Only if we know the nature of the mental defilements, get rid of them, then we see that that the true nature within you. By no means you are inferior to the Buddhist hegemony. We are all equal. 
the true nature, we all have this Buddhahood within each one of us. So that is, at the moment, not manifested. So for that matter, we need to know the nature of the mental defilements. And the mental defilements are of two kinds, the gross and the subtle. Like the solid garlic and the smell of the garlic. Solid garlic, if somebody smashes the garlic in your mug and you don't take any garlic, and the, the person is very apologetic, the person will remove the garlic. After you remove the garlic, the solid garlic, you wash it so well, and you smell it, although there's no trace of garlic left, you smell it, still it smells garlic. Likewise, say the metal defilement, the solid metal defilements are already gone rid of, which the solid one referred to as the afflictive obscurations. When you remove them completely, still the smell is left. That is known as cognitive obscurations. It is so important, and particularly um, the, the participants who are already deeper into the study of the Buddhist philosophy, um, the, into emptiness concept. It is very important for all of us, even those who, are, who may think that you are a beginner, I would suggest that we all have to explore what exactly is this cognitive obscuration. The garlic smell, smell like, the garlic smell like the mental defilements, referred to as the cognitive obscuration. What exactly is this cognitive obscuration? That is so important. Only if we identify what these cognitive obscurations are, then we can think of eradicating it and then achieve the total enlightenment. Okay. So now the afflictive obscurations, the grosser one, which is like the solid garlic, it is of three kinds. One is the contaminated karmas, Number two is afflictions. Number three is the active seeds of these two, contaminant karmas and afflictions. And then, so all these three, somehow they hover around what is known as the self-grasping ignorance. So the remedy, remedy to overcome the self-grasping ignorance and thus to overcome all the offshoots of the self-grasping ignorance should be the wisdom. Because the ignorance is like the darkness. Just as in Da, you don't see what is around you. Likewise, with ignorance, you don't see the, what is the, the reality. So, just as to remove the darkness, it is only through introducing the light. It is only through introducing the light of the wisdom that the darkness of ignorance can be eliminated. So, the wisdom plays a very important role. In Buddhism, in the teachings of Buddha, something which is so unique about the Buddha's teachings, it is a tremendous emphasis on cultivating wisdom. So the wisdom, the wisdom of emptiness, which we are studying here for these three days. So that is an extremely important role. That is what we need to cultivate. One, to eradicate the afflictive obscurations. One part. Then on the other hand, this, the garlic smell like mental defilements, the inactive seeds of the contaminated karmas and afflictions, these inactive seeds. So they are the inactive seeds, somehow rooted to the, what is known as the, the inactive seed of the self-grasping ignorance. So this inactive seed of the self-grasping ignorance, because it is inactive, like the smell of the garlic, it has no solid potential garlic in the air, but the smell is still there. Likewise, the inactive seeds of the afflictions and the contaminant karmas, they cannot germinate into afflictions anymore, but that seed is the one which obstructs us from achieving total enlightenment. So that inactive seed, when it is there, it manifests in the form of this self-centered attitude. Inactive seed per se is not the self-centered attitude, but that can, that as a result, self-centered attitude is manifested. So we see that in our mind, finally, what makes us not really, say, the, the happy, the way we intend it, the way we, we intend, the happiness not coming, and so we are, instead, we are so much of, say, fear, anxiety, strength, so forth, is all because of these two demons, self-grasping ignorance, which is the root of the afflictive obscurations, and the inactive seed of the self-grasping ignorance, which is the root of all the cognitive obscurations, and thus manifesting in the form of self-centered attitude. In other words, self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude, these are the two demons. The moment these two are together, the moment these two are together, all the offshoots in the form of afflictions, say the uh, contaminant karmas, they all arise out of these two. So, th if there is something which is really harmful to us, Instead of external people there, external factors there. So it is, 
It is these two demons, self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude that really makes us suffer. Okay, so with this understanding, self-grasping ignorance to, to curb this, we apply the remedy, the remedy in the form of wisdom of emptiness. And a self-centered attitude, again, because that it is at the base, it is as the, the inactive seed of the self-grasping ignorance, remedy remains the same. The wisdom of emptiness, in both cases, the remedy remains the same, but the driving force differs. So where the self-grasping ignorance, just to eradicate the self-grasping ignorance, the remedy is the wisdom of emptiness, yet supported by the renunciation. And whereas for to eradicate the cognitive obscuration, the subtle inactive seeds, the remedy is the wisdom of emptiness, and the, the driven by the force of bodhicitta, grounded on, the renunciation. So that is uh, what we need to, to think of. So from this we get a feeling that, okay, finally what is dharma? What is dharma? Is finally to bring about transformation within your mind. And from what we have learned thus far, particularly pertaining to the, the third point, what is the purpose of this practice, to awaken this Buddha, Buddha nature within yourself, we come to realize that it is through the wisdom of emptiness as the actual remedy, and the, say, the, in terms of the driving force, the bodhicitta and the renunciation. And this, this wisdom, this wisdom of emptiness, and the, it is like the, the, the light. And this light, keep in mind that this light, this light should have two qualities. This light should have two qualities. One is that it should be a very bright light. If the light is very feeble, that the purpose of the light is to read books and to appreciate the beautiful paintings. If the light is so dull, so dull and feeble, then you cannot appreciate the beautiful paintings there. You cannot appreciate the subtlety of the paintings there. You cannot, cannot read the books. So the light must be very bright. One. Then number two, that the light, while being very bright, if the light is flickery, if the light is flickery, for example, say, if there's a corner from a corner, there's a wind, a very gentle wind blowing, and the candlelight is flickery there, again, it does not serve the purpose for you to appreciate the, the painting. It's so disturbing. So the light must be very bright, and it must be very steady. So, the brightness is the analytical skill, analytical skill to see things in its true form. So that is what we call as the intelligence or the wisdom. And this wisdom must be supplemented, complemented by the steadiness, steadiness quality, quality of the steadiness. So that steadiness will be given to us by the shamatha practice. So therefore, what we need is the wisdom of emptiness, supported by the shamatha practice to build the steadiness and then grounded on the bodhicitta, bodhicitta which in turn should be based on the renunciation. So renunciation, bodhicitta, wisdom of emptiness and shamatha practice. So therefore, if from the people here, if you really need to practice, to design a very meaningful practice for your life, if you want to, so eventually, somebody wants to become a monastic, monks, nuns, so good. Even if not, if you have these four things intact, the practice of the renunciation, bodhicitta, wisdom of emptiness, and the shamatha, these four things intact, then you have a complete form, you have a complete practice, right? And even if you become a monk or a nun, finally we have to practice these four. So therefore, even as lay practitioners, you can practice this form, right? So this, if you can design properly in your life, your life is full of meaning. This is perfect meaning, and then you don't have to really uh, say, the, you, you will see that finally, okay, now I've found the meaning of my life. Okay, with that in mind, on the, so this is as a part of the setting of the proper motivation. With that in mind, let's turn to page two of the prayer book. And I think for the those having the the blaze, the brown one is on page three, page three, and those with uh, the blue, page two. And just for information, that the this blue version is the the older generation book, older generation 
blue one, and the other one is the new generation. Within the new generation, again, there are many new generations already came up. So now the final version is on the verge to come out. Final version is on the verge to come out, and I'm very sorry to TPC for printing all these things, importing from Delhi, right? Okay, so there are so many generations coming up. I'm very sorry for that. Okay, so this book would be extremely, extremely beneficial for all of us. For all of us. So the, in fact, the, I would be very happy that the see, TBC, the KCLA was thinking of offering to make more printouts, print, printouts of this the fun version, the published version. So that can be done, may be, can be made easily available to the Singaporeans and Malaysians also, right? So Casey was there. Okay, so the, um, you can freely get the last, ver the fun version, which has, which is extremely, extremely, so many hands involved there to improvise on this. And then the end notes are there, added there, footnotes are added there, and the glossaries are added there, very helpful book. And then, in fact, the, the, the basis of this book was that when I was translating for His Holiness the Dalai Lama for about like six years, the, the main root text on the basis of which His Holiness gave, gave the teachings for many years, I, as the English translator, translator, I was compiling all of them, and then later on, on top of these, the, the text compiled, then whatever we found more important, we added them. So it was um, like, I said, 10 years of effort and so many people, the, the contribution also involved there. So this would be a very handy help, the help book uh, for, for each one of us. Okay, with that in mind, let's turn to the book. And let, imagine that you are leading this and everyone is joining you, including your two parents and all sentient beings. Okay. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma. <coughs> I pay homage. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. In dependent origination, there is no ceasing, no rising, no annihilation, no permanent. I prostrate to the mothers of the Buddhas and of the hearers and the Bodhisattvas, who through the knowledge of all these hearers seek in pacification the complete peace, who through the knowledge of paths cause the souls helping my greatest to achieve the aims of the world, and who through the possession of omniscience help subduers, the one who has transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher, Sugata, and the protector to you are my prostrations the one who has eliminated the web of conceptualizations and is endowed with the divine bodies of the vast and the profound, who eternally shines for the forever noble light race. To you, the Buddha, I make prostrations. Okay, let us recite the essence of dependent origination mantra. <clears throat> Om Yetharama Hetu Prabhavam Hetum te shantata gato yavatat te sham chayo niroda evam vati mahashramana yeswaha om yetarama hetu prabhava Hetum te sham tata gato yavatat te sham chayo niroda evam vati mahashramana yeswaha om yetharama hetu prabhava <coughs> Sham tatha gato yavatat te sham chayo niroda 
Evamati Mahashramana Yeswaha All phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata, the cessation of causes as well as taught by the great seer. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations for the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations for the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations for the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye Jyoda Soge Chonam Da Chanjo Bardo Dane Gyapsuj Dage Jin Soge Be Chonam Ge Dola Penjere Sangye Trubare Shum Sangye Jyoda Soge Chonam Da Chanjo Bardo Dane Gyapsuj Dage Jin Soge Be Chonam Ge Dola penjere sangye dhubare shu Sangye chota soge chonam Chanju bardu dhani kyapsu che Dage chin so kebe chonam Dola penjere sangye dhubare shu Okay, let us recite Harsutta Mantra Page 17, the blue book And page 31, I think page 31, the red book uh, the blue one, page 17, I think. <clears throat> okay, as we recite this mantra, the this mantra, dependent origination mantra, and this mantra, if you can really recite these two for the people who are deceased, people who are sick, who are hospitalized, who are going through terminal illness, and you are, say, the, the, the deceased, the late parents, grandparents, and so forth, that would be extremely beneficial. And of course, um, you know the meaning, recite the mantras would be even more beneficial, right? Okay, so let's the, recite this. As we recite this, just visualize that Buddha Shakyamuni for so affectionately, so lovingly, um, the exhausts us thus. Don't remain in the fears of samsara. Come, come to us ultimate happiness. And you hearing this melodious voice of Buddha Shakyamuni, you inspire your two parents and all the ascension beings, informing them. Listen, listen to the compassionate teacher Buddha Shakyamuni. Let us not remain in the fears anymore. Let us all go towards ultimate happiness. And everyone hearing you, what you are saying, they are so inspired and they happily join you in this journey of cleansing the mind to proceed towards ultimate happiness. With that in mind, you are leading this, and all sentient beings are joining you. Deyata om gati gati Paragati Parasamgati bodhisvahatyata 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 
Satyata Om Gati Gati Paragati Parasangati Bodhiswaha Okay, five minutes meditation. <clears throat> okay, quickly, a very quick review of the what meditation that we are doing. This is a single point of meditation as a part of Shamatha practice. For that, four points to keep in mind. The body posture. Number two, focal point. What is number three? Identifying the areas of meditation. Number four? Applying the remedies to overcome the errors for points. Okay, for the point number one, see if you can sit cross-legged, not necessarily here, in your rooms. Just see if you can sit cross-legged. That would be extremely beneficial for you. To that, the, the main benefit is that the, the body, you see that you, you can maintain the freshness of your uh, mind throughout your practice. One, then the body must be upright. That is so important. Body must be upright. And to just see if you can make it a habit to sit upright all the time. So during the practice, don't lean against the support, but then during the, say, the post-meditation, then you can lean against, the, lean against the support, that's fine, but still keep your body upright. That is extremely important. And while your body is upright, make sure that your body is flexible. It should not be rigid. It should be flexible. Then the head tilted forward a little bit. And the eyes not closed. This is so important. Eyes not closed. And later on, when you gain expertise in meditation, expertise in meditation, then there are specific practices where you have to keep your eyes closed. And then you have to do the practice in a total dark um, the environment. So this is something very specialized meditation um, the, to, be, uh, to be coming to us later on when we gain proficiency in the practice of meditation with the eyes open. Okay, so eyes open is so important. Fortified, half, half open, fortified, there is cast down, and you're bound to have difficulties, I know. And if you have such difficulties, you must meet with the proper teachers. Right? Okay, so for example, with the, um, the, the ABC, the Cambridge is there, and then the Rumble George is there, and then the many senior students also there. And for TPC we have uh, Gishi Yundana is there, and many senior the teachers, the senior the students also there. So make sure that you learn these things. The questions are bound to be there, right? Say difficulties, challenges are there. Okay, so eyes half open, and then the tip of the tongue should touch the upper palate to avoid excessive accumulation of saliva in the mouth. And then keep your teeth and lips in the natural state. Breathe naturally. And roll your right hand on your left hand. And the tips of the two thumbs joining, form a, forming a triangle. Place the two hands on your laps in a restful state. Okay, this is your body posture. Number two is the focal point. We're going to meditate here. There are so many versions of the focal points. So what we're doing here is a very simple one, yet extremely helpful. Uh, particularly to distress the individual. And this practice is a very secular in nature, uh, which has no, say, the religious denominations. So this is extremely uh, good practice. Anybody can practice it. Okay, just visualize a tiny dot, white dot, 1 mm or 2 mm in diameter between nose and upper lip. So this way we're going to focus this tiny dot. And meanwhile, multitasking, multitasking while you watch while you mentally focus your mind on the tiny dot there then you count your breath breathe in breathe out cycle one breathe in breathe out cycle two um, you can do it for five minutes and at home at home when you're by yourself if you're a beginner I would suggest you don't do it five minutes here in group doing five minutes it's going to be fine. When you're by yourself, then doing five minutes is going to be too long. So what you do is that do it for like two minutes or to keep it safe, 21 cycles. 
21 cycles, meaning breath in, breath out, cycle 1, breath in, breath out, cycle 2, likewise 21 times. 21 times will take you like one and a half minutes. And then if you're so excited that it is so short, right, then you can keep a gap of like a six seconds and again do the next cycle, next uh, 21 cycles. Okay, but here we're going to do uh, for five minutes because there are many uh, senior students also and uh, so we'll all do this for five minutes. So this is point number two, the focal point. Point number three, identifying the errors of meditation. Errors of meditation, there are two, a mental laxity and mental excitement. Mental laxity is when your mind becomes so passive, lethargic, heavy, sloppy, and inserviceable. And the other side is the mental excitement, when the mind is overactive and distracted, scattered. So these are the, should any of these two things happen, don't panic, go for them. Number four, apply the remedies to overcome the errors. And the remedy is twofold, mindfulness and introspection. First one is introspection, same, if you lost your pet dog, first you go in search of the pet dog. Your mind, which is meant to be meditating, so that is like a pet dog. And in this mind, instead of sitting on the focal point, if it is distracted or in a lax state, then you have to go in search of this mind. So that is the introspection. Once you find the pet dog, then the job of the introspection is done. Next is the job of the, say, the, the rope. Tie the dog with the rope, bring it back home, and tie it to the pillar at your house. Likewise, when you find the, that your mind is distracted or in a lax state, then apply the the robe of the mindfulness. Bring the mind back to, with this robe of the mindfulness, bring the mind back to the intended object of the meditation. Okay, this is what we're going to do for five minutes. Ready? <clears throat> Are you ready? Okay. Um, so yesterday what we learned is the this mantra Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava Hetum Desham Tatagato Hevatat Desham Jayu Niruta Evam Vati Mashramane Soham. All phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. The cessation of causes as well is taught by the great seer. So this is what we learned, what we learned yesterday. So from this, the, the understanding is that all phenomena arise from causes. It, what it means is precisely, precisely, um, okay, so this is the, what we need to learn here. I say, in the first place, that we become associated with the various, say, the religious traditions, or the Dharma centers, and the friends, and even the friends, you slowly turn towards people who are more spiritually inclined. So there, why in the first place we go towards, our mind is directed towards that, that 
something spiritual in nature, whether center, the place, denominations, or friends. Spiritual nature, because we see that a life, a life, there's a tremendous pressure. And so much of the same, even if you see that, that okay, my life is not really the stressful, my life is happy, okay. So if there's somebody who can say this, it may be a very young one. <laughs> Maybe age 10, 11, 12, what is suffering, right? Otherwise, here, here they say the, so I don't know if there's anyone who is below 20, Please raise your hands. Anyone who is below 20? Okay, which means that we all have our experience, life experience, and life is not easy. Life is not easy. That is for sure. That is for sure, life is not easy. Because the life is not easy, I'll say, we have to ask this question to ourselves. Finally, what, what's the meaning of my life? His Holiness the Dalai Lama, when he was giving a public talk in Delhi University, I remember in 2008, I think, at the end of the talk during the question and answer session, there was a girl who asked this question to His Holiness. Your Holiness, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? So His Holiness, without second thought, said that we, the meaning of life is a genuine happiness. We live in hope, and we hope for Happiness. For we live on hope and we hope for happiness. So the genuine happiness is the meaning of life. So this is what his soul has said. And then now, if I ask the same question to each one of you, what do you want? Right? So just see if you agree with me or not. Just see if you agree with me or not. Before we actually go into more detail of this, the, the embrace of dependent origination. Just see if you agree with me or not. Okay, happiness is one thing, but I have so many life challenges, so many fears in life. I cannot really say, see what, will, what, what tomorrow is going to be like for me, right? I don't know what tomorrow is. It's very unpredictable, it's very scary. Okay, so there, one, there, there are two things. One is that we are scared of saying there's so much of fear in our life. One. Number two is that, number two is that, say, people who have the basic necessities, basic necessities, and then uh, they say, life is very boring, right? Life is very boring. Okay. So then, they want happiness. They, they want excitement. They want adventure and so forth. So from this, what I can loosely say is that what's the meaning of life? As His Holiness so beautifully encapsulated in what is known as the genuine happiness, I can split this into two. Say, I want to be freed from suffering. I want to be free from fears of life. Fears of life, not necessarily the fear of a ghost. This is a very extreme version of the fear. For example, the fear of are they same or not getting a promotion? Right? Fear of not getting a promotion. Fear of not getting a job. Fear of losing a job. Right? And then say the fear of say the my mother maybe scolding me. Right? Fear of not usually not the mother, for the child scolding the mother. <laughs> right? Usually the mother fearing what my daughter may tell me now, what my son might tell me now. These are all, although not really on an extreme form, but these are all the forms of the fears. All the forms of the fears. So fears ranging from 0 0.0001 through to 99.9% .9 and eventually 100% of the fears. One. This is one part. So what, what we want is, I want to get rid of all forms of fears, be it small or big or whatever. All forms of fears. This is what I want. Number one. Number two. I want maximum happiness. I want happiness. What degree of happiness do you want? 10%, 20%, 30%. What degree of happiness do you want? Hey, what degree of happiness do you want? 100% if possible. 100%. You're getting it? So the point is that, okay, just agree. Do you agree with me or not? That if somebody asks you what is the meaning of life, one is that 
I want to get the, if there is a possibility, I want to get rid of all my fears. Just raise your hands who agree with me. Raise your hands who agree with me. If possible, I can, you know, to get rid of all my fears in life. One. Okay, who is that person who said that agenda of my life is to get rid of all my fears? Buddhist or non-Buddhist? Singaporeans, non-Singaporeans? Boys or girls? 20 plus or 20 below? Huh? All. It's not a matter of, uh, only if I'm a Buddhist, only if I'm a, the, the, the Muslims, Christians, Hindus. No, everyone, whether believer or not believer, everybody wants to get rid of the, the fears of life. If you want, because I don't have time, I'd like to give you two equations, right? Summarize everything in two equations or two formulas. The first formula, if you want to get rid of all the fears, the final panacea to get rid of all the fears is the wisdom of emptiness. The final panacea to get rid of all the fears is the wisdom of emptiness. You have the wisdom of emptiness, guarantee that whoever you are, Buddhist, non-Buddhist, boys, girls, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, right? 20 plus, 20 below. Everyone, anybody who gets the wisdom of emptiness, your fear will go away. Guaranteed. Number one. Right? So the formula for the, to get the, recipe, the recipe to get rid of the fears is the wisdom of emptiness. I'm not going to go into detail. Then the other part, what do you want? I want infinite happiness, if possible, 100% happiness. Okay, tell me, who, who wants that? If possible, 100% happiness. Okay, boys or girls? Everyone. Believers, non-believers, everybody seeks 100% happiness. If you really seek 100% happiness, the formula that I give you is that practice unconditional love of bodhicitta. Practice unconditional love of bodhicitta, you see that your happiness simply soars. Your, simply, your happiness simply, say, the flares like anything, right? It becomes so expensive. So these are the two simple formulas. One, to get rid of fears, practice wisdom of emptiness, you become the most fearless person. If you really want infinite happiness, maximum happiness, practice unconditional love. And how to practice unconditional love? Again, the point is that, just I will tell you the, the two methods, the sevenfold cause of a method to generate bodhicitta, and the method of equalizing and exchanging self for others. These two methods. And precisely for some people, the first may be very effective, and in many other, in most of the cases, I would guarantee that the second one would be extremely, extremely effective. Unfortunately, today, how many people are actually practicing these two things? The bodhicittas is so less unfortunately. This is a very unfortunate story. While everybody craves to have maximum happiness, but really looking for the ways and means to, 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 to achieve that. Is by so this happiness is not randomly produced. It is produced through their respective causes. Ye dharma hetu prabhava. All these phenomena they arise from causes. So even the infinite happiness that you're seeking is also because of the causes. What causes the practice of the unconditional love of the bodhicitta? So this, unfortunately, people, if you say, particularly say, if you check with some people who are into, or, or say, the long-term dharma practice and so forth, if you ask them, what kind of practice are you doing? If you hear that, oh, I practice bodhicitta, this amazing, so, so precious. You are very lucky to have met somebody who says that I practice bodhicitta. But in most cases, you see that, oh, the, I practice this very sophisticated practice, this tantra, this mantra, and so forth. <laughs> very complicated practices are there, right? I don't mean to demean these people. The, pra the point is that, as I said earlier, renunciation. Bodhicitta, wisdom of emptiness, shamatha. These four things are there. You can do any practice. You can go anywhere you like. You're the purpose of your life is not missed. The meaning of your life is not missed. The two agendas of your life is not missed. What is the two agenda? Be kind to yourself and be wisely kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself means give what you want. I want to get it off all of my fears and I want to have the maximum happiness. This is the meaning of be kind to yourself. But how to be kind to myself? Be wisely kind to yourself. 
Meaning that, say, after, after about like 10 years, right? And then, say, you have some difficulties, life challenges, you go through very difficult times, tough times, and then suddenly you remember, oh, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, in some way, in the center somewhere in Singapore, 2000, I think 18 or 19, I'm getting mixed up, <laughs> right? So there somebody came and said that be kind to yourself, <laughs> right? Okay, now I'm in such a tough time, I should be kind to myself, I'll, do, I'll go to pubs. <laughs> I'll go to pubs, right? So in order to distress myself, a drink so that my, you know, I'm kind to myself to remove my stress. This is, although you try to be kind to yourself, but you are being very unwisely kind to yourself. So the second agenda is be wisely kind to yourself. Don't do those things which will bring miseries. Do those things which will actually give happiness to you. This is the meaning. So what is that thing to be done? Very simple. What do you want? I want to get rid of fears. If you want to get rid of fears, embrace wisdom of emptiness. And what do you want? I want infinite happiness. If you want infinite happiness, embrace unconditional love of bodhicitta. As simple as that. That these two become the agenda of your life. Right? So with this in mind, with this in mind, all phenomena arise from causes. The happiness that you seek, the miseries that you shun, they don't arise randomly. They arise from their respective causes. He Dharma Hetu Hetu Prabhava. All these phenomena they arise from causes. These phenomena precisely the phenomena of suffering that we want to shun. The phenomena of dissatisfactions that we want to shun, they arise from their respective causes. Now, what are the causes? The causes, finally, while the, during the setting of the proper motivation, we learn that all these miseries, they are, they are caused by the afflictive obscurations and the cognitive obscurations. And precisely, precisely, say the, the miseries, they are caused by the afflictive obscurations. And particular for the senior students, what I, what I would say is that afflictive obscurations, everything boils down to self-grasping ignorance. And yet this self-grasping ignorance per se cannot do to ignite the gross afflictions. It requires the help of this self-centered attitude. Self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude combined together will give rise to all the offshoots of the gross, afflict gross afflictions. And then contaminant commas and then miseries. This is the, the reality. Now, knowing what the causes of the miseries are, how to get rid of the, the how to get rid of all the, the, the causes. So to get rid of the miseries, we have to get rid of the causes. How to get rid of the causes? Find all these causes, what we come to realize uh, pertaining to the miseries, the causes self-grasping ignorance. So to get rid of self-grasping ignorance, we have to introduce the wisdom. What wisdom? This is the question. What is the wisdom? So the wisdom is the wisdom is the mind which discerns, a discerning mind whose apprehension of the object tallies with the reality. The wisdom is a discerning mind whose apprehension of the object tallies with the reality. What's the next question? What's the reality? What's the reality? Okay, so this reality is the indicated here, the cessation of the causes as well as taught by the great seer. How to bring an end to these causes of the miseries by introducing the wisdom, by means of introducing the reality, is what the Tathagata, the great seer, taught. Okay, so with this, the basic introduction, let's turn to the in praise of dependent origination. <clears throat> it should have, you, you might have the handout, or you have the, the blue book, or you have the red book. It is there with all three. Okay, so with the, the blue book, where is, where is it? Which page number? In praise of dependent, page 52. The blue, blue one, page 52. The red one? Page 99. Okay, page 99. The, the blaze of non-dual bodhicittas. That, that book, we... You gave the title, The Blaze of Non-Dual Bodhicittas. Bodhicittas with the plural. That is, ultimate bodhicitta and the conventional bodhicitta, the two. Say, the, to get rid of all the fears, what did you, what did you learn? 
to get rid of, if you want to get rid of all the fears, what should we cultivate? We should cultivate the wisdom of emptiness. So that, that wisdom of emptiness, in the loose sense, is referred to as the ultimate bodhicitta. And then if you want infinite happiness, what should we cultivate? Unconditional love of bodhicitta. That is the conventional bodhicitta. So these two things combined together, the blaze of the blaze of the non-dual bodhicittas. These two sh should not be practiced in isolation. Two, these two must be practiced in combination, in, in union. The blaze of the non-dual, no, in a non-dual form. These two must be practiced together. This is the title of the book. You getting it? So this is the title of the book, and we see that if somebody asks you what is the agenda, what is the final agenda of your life, what is the meaning of your life, you just remember the title of this book, The Blaze of Non-Dual Bodhicittas. <laughs> right? That is the meaning of your life. That is the purpose of your life. That is the, the, the agenda of your life. Okay, with that in mind, um, I'm going to read through the, read through, say the initial few passages, they are like laying the ground for us, and then uh, we go into the technicalities, right? We go into technicalities, so, and then particularly yesterday somebody asked me, what is emptiness, right? What is emptiness? So there, they, if you get something of the emptiness today and tomorrow, don't disclose this to the monastic universities in Sera Debung, and then they'll for sure feel envious of you because they study emptiness for like 20 years. <laughs> and you are studying this for two years, not two days. <laughs> not only full, not full two days, right? Two hours, two days, right? They'll feel envious. Okay, so the point is that we are going to delve into the technicalities once in a while. I'll try to make it as simple as possible. But those of us who are beginners, right? Don't feel demoral, don't feel overwhelmed, right? Don't feel overwhelmed. Okay, don't feel overwhelmed, particularly the beginners. So when I go into the technicalities, right, knowing that there are many senior, the senior students, right, the good practitioners, senior students, you feel free to discuss with them as well. And then later on, with the the Geshe-las, the Venerable Georges here, then the Kenan Buche and the Geshe Yendalam, all of them are there, so you can uh, say they learn from them. So I'm going to give from these texts, this is incredibly precious text. Okay. Uh, he, who, he who speaks on the basis of seeing, this makes him no knower and teacher unexcelled. I bow, to, I bow to you, O conqueror, you who saw dependent origination and taught it. Conqueror here refers to the Buddha, the, the Buddha who conquered all the mental demons. The Buddha who conquered all the mental, mental demons. The real demon is not external demon. The real demon is the one who obstructs your Buddha nation inside. That is the real demon. So, the, the one who conquers the, the demon of the, the, the mind. This makes him a knower, a teacher unexcelled. I bow to you, O conqueror, you who so dependent origination and taught it. Okay, who speaks on the basis of seeing? Meaning that the Buddha, you taught this emptiness, you taught this dependent origination, you not by imitating from somebody else, you by imitating somebody else. You know this, you saw this through your own eyes, through your own wisdom eyes, and then you taught it accordingly. So this makes you a very special teacher. So to you, I make the prostration. So look at the, even the word of salutation. Through reading this word of salutation, we see the Buddha, in fact, the Buddha Shakyamuni performed so much of miracles, performed so many miracles, in his lifetime. But, for example, this text written by Lama Tsongkhapa, and then Arunigarjuna, Arunigarjuna's text, and Acharya Chandrakriti's text, there, if you read the word of salutation written by those, composed by those masters uh, to the Buddha Shakyamuni, they never praised the Buddha Shakyamuni for having performed miracles. Instead, finally, finally, what really helps us? Finally, what really helps us? Right? For example, say, usually, um, the, say, if today, today, right, if I levitate two feet now here, if I levitate two feet and stay, stay like this in the air for like two minutes, right, there's going to be traffic jam in this place. <laughs> Guaranteed traffic jam. Because people want to see the miracles, they want to study, they do want to study emptiness. 
They want to see miracles. And the miracles, do they help you? Miracles, do they help you? At the most, what will you do? You will say, wow. <laughs> and then you go back to your house, go back to your house, right? Say, they just spread this word, wow. <laughs> right? And what do you have? You, you get nothing. You cannot levitate. Right? After saying, wow, you cannot levitate. If you levitate, that's wonderful. You cannot levitate. So you don't get anything out of somebody performing miracles. But, right, in what way you truly can be benefited if, is if somebody helps you, if somebody helps you to give the blaze of the non-dual bodhicittas. Wisdom of emptiness and bodhicitta. Wisdom of emptiness and bodhicitta, in which case, you, we have to be taught. It's not that somebody just performs it and you get it. Right? We have to be taught. So therefore it says, he who speaks on the basis of seeing, what he realizes, the Buddha Shakyam and Prince Siddharth, what he realizes of the emptiness, wisdom of emptiness, and the bodhicitta, what he realizes, then he taught this through his own experience. This makes him a knower and teacher and excelled about to you, O conqueror, you who so dependent origination and taught it. This concept of dependent origination. What we are talking about is the emptiness, and then here Lama Tsongkhapa <coughs> was mentioning dependent origination. What's the relationship in these two things? Dependent origination and emptiness. This is so important, so important, right? So I will touch on this area a little bit later. Stanza 2, whatever degeneration they are in the world, the root of all these is ignorance. Okay, so just relate this to our own life. Don't think that, okay, Lama Tsongkhapa, you know, he was talking about the degenerations, the miseries, sufferings, and so forth. Okay, of the helpings, hungry ghosts, relate this to you. Relate this to your life. For example, say, when you, you are expecting a promotion and you don't get that promotion. Right? And then you are expecting a business. Business? And then suddenly it, the, it is shattered. Right? And then say, uh, you are expecting, say, sometimes very unfortunate things can happen. Right? For example, I remember, say, somebody, somebody had an accident. And then a relative went to pick that person and take to the hospital. Coming back from the hospital, the person who went to help the, the, the person met accident and died. Very extremely unexpected things can happen to all of us. So don't relate this to some, some way outside the air. Relate this to ourselves. Relate this to your family members. Relate this to your, the people around you. Right? And then see that all, whatever degenerations, all the, the mishaps, all the mental tension, stress that we are going through in the world, the root of all these is ignorance. Who's ignorance? Outside or yours? Huh? Okay, ours. Ours ignorance. But how you, you don't speak so loudly now? From there I could see that you don't really agree with this fully. <laughs> right? Because, okay, for example, say, my, my neighbor who plays very loud music, I didn't do anything. I'm not getting us the, the Sunday uh, the sound sleep, right? And then the, 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 the neighbor playing loud music and disturbing him. I didn't do anything. So this is not my ignorance, it's my neighbor's disturbance. You know, we point a finger outside. Right? Don't forget this. This is so important. So whatever we learn, don't think that, okay, the Holy Lama Tsongkhapa, whatever you say, I, I will take follow, although I don't agree with you. <laughs> right? Don't do like this. Whatever is being said there, make sure that you are convinced. If you're not convinced, feel free to discuss with senior students. Feel free to discuss this with your teachers. This is so important. Right? Okay, in this connection, Sound of a clap, right? This sound of a clap should necessarily come into being by the combination of the two hands. Do you agree with me or not? Yes. Okay, then you are louder, I'm happy. <laughs> right? Okay. This sound of a clap is because of the two hands coming together. So these two hands, one hand symbolizes external factors and the other hand symbolizing the internal factors too. So when these two factors come together, 
Invariably, the sound arises. The sound symbolic of the miseries. Sound symbolic of the stress of your life. Sound symbolic of the tension of your life. It is simply the result of these two factors. External and internal factor coming together. The two factors coming together. Right? So therefore, sometimes we go into the extremes. One extreme is that, right, that, oh, I saw this text which says all the degenerations there in the world, the root of all this is ignorance. And then if you read Lama, the Lama Chapa, the Guru Puja there, right, all the miseries, they are the, because of my self-centered attitude, because of that. Right? Okay. So there, this part is there. Okay, yeah. So, so all problems is your mental creation, is your problem, is your mental, you know, self-centered attitude. Right? It's all because of that. This is one extreme. Saying that all problems, they are just not really external. Everyone is good. The whole world is very nice. It's your thinking. It's your men, uh, mind. Uh, the, your mental, let's say, the fabrication, your mind emitted. If the world is nice, everyone is nice. This is the one extreme. And the extreme is, okay, the problem is because of this person. Right? Yesterday we did the exercise. Right? Why I could not do the, ma the mathematics, although it's a very simple mathematics, because you are seeing so fast. <laughs> right? Always pointing the finger outside. This one extreme. Right? This one extreme, always, and then say them, but no, in the, I read, I went to this, what is it, this center? Chang uh, Changkling. Changkling center, and I, I learned that the, whatever digits is there in the world, the root of, the, this is the ignorance, one's own ignorance. Oh, but it doesn't make any sense, please, please keep, keep, keep this aside, right? So this is another extreme, excessive materialism. Blaming outside and not at all seeing the, the, the seeing was inside. It, the reality is all problems somehow they are connected with the two, ex, two factors. External factor and internal factors. Without any of these two factors are missing, the sound will stop. You're getting it? It's not that it is purely, purely, just purely your own mistake. No. External factors also there. Right? And it's not 100% external. Internal fact is also there. Both are there. Right? For example, say, but what is a mental attitude? What is a mental attitude? Do we blame the external factor more or internal factor more? Uh, more external. If not 100%, 99.9% we blame external. Right? Yesterday you blame me. <laughs> right? you, say, you said it so fast. Right? So this is, this is our mentality, always to blame outside. And this is also wrong. And then some people, they go to the other extreme. Oh no, every world is perfect, my teacher said it, right? It's my mistake, it's my mistake, I'm a hopeless person, I'm the, the, the. And then this is also one extreme. So avoid the two extremes, know the facts. Always know the facts. And if you don't get a satisfactory answer from one teacher, Right? You can ask the second person. If you don't get the second satisfactory answer from the second person, go to the third person. Must be convinced. If not convinced, you don't have to follow blindly. This is the point. So the reality is that sound of a clap is symbolizing the miseries. They should necessarily arise from the combination of two factors, external factors and internal factors. You're getting it? Okay. So with this in mind, now the point is that you do, it's up to you. It's not that you have to, in fact, I remember my teacher, Gyanam Nimba, Venerable Gyanam amazing, great teacher. When I was just a teenager, when I was just a teenager, I was in a school, not a monk, I was in a school, and then the, the, he was a hermit there, and I did not know him, and then Somehow, one of the senior students said that if you have questions on Dharma, you can go and ask in So I went there. I went there, and then initially he was little. He was, you know, he got information from somebody that oh, there's one boy who wants to who had a number of questions. So even the venerable guest, I remember he was little, you know, apprehensive, little, maybe a little nervous. This boy may be too sarcastic about Buddhism, and my thought was, I would say the, 
skeptic in nature. So I sat there, and Gail Amripa was also otherwise just radiant, you won't believe, extremely radiant. And then the moment this young boy, teenager boy came, not as a believer, but with questions. So Gail Amripa was also a little, a little reserved. He was also a little reserved. Okay, young boy, questions. Then I started to ask questions, and my questions are very genuine, not really sarcastic. So he felt relaxed. And then he said that if you don't have suffering, you don't have to practice dharma. If you have no suffering, you don't have to practice dharma. Dharma is to make sure that your suffering is addressed. If you have no suffering, you don't need dharma, you don't need Buddhism. This is what, that shocked me. I thought that the Buddhism was totally, as a teenager, Thought that maybe age 17, 16, 17, thought that Dharma is like something that you believe in, is my religion. This was my, uh, the, the thought earlier. And then he said it. I was really, it really shook my, say, the, the kind of faith or quite the, the, my take on Dharma. And then I went, wow, this is amazing. Right? So the point is that we should maintain this, that the con conviction must be gained. Conviction must be gained. With this, the point is that the external factors are there, internal factors are there, both are there, both are there. And now the point is, you can do anything. So, say, the sound of a clap, it disturbs you, right? Either you remove the right hand, or you remove the left hand, right? Or you remove both, right? The point is, to remove the both and to remove one hand, to remove one hand is easier, yes, you do agree with me? Okay, which of the two hands you are going to remove, external or internal? I sure. <laughs> yesterday, how you were doing, right? Yesterday, how you were blaming me? You are so keen. You are saying fast, right? You are saying fast. And you go to Delhi, right? You go to Delhi, you'll say that it's so hot. You will, not, you will not say that my body is weak to take the, the heart. <laughs> you don't say this. Right? And now you go to Delhi, you say that, oh, it's so cold. No, it's so cold. You don't say that my body is so weak that I cannot take the cold. My body is weak. You don't say this. Always blame the external. Right? So this is our mentality. But don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to say that, to, to, to blame the external and to remove the external. But how realistic it is, how practical it is to get rid of the external factors. If you can do this, do it. Finally, they say the right hand, if the right hand symbolizes the external factors, remove the right hand, right? And with the internal factor, it's fine, no sound. How is strong the internal factor? No sound. Sound of the misery stops. One. How realistic that is. External factors, tell me how many external factors are there? 10, 20, 100, huh? Hey, how many? Countless. countless. While you say countless, but we are so addicted to pointing to external factors, right? External factors are countless. And why do we point to the external factors and blame the external factors? Expecting that I can get rid of the external factors. If you can, do it, right? If you can, do it. This is what is known as materialism. With the materialism, if you can get rid of all the external factors, do it, fine. Finally, it is not that you have to go into spirituality. Finally, the agenda is to get rid of your miseries. If you can get rid of the external factors, and the sound of the misery stops, go for it, right? But the reality is that external factors, in the first place, it is innumerable in number innumerable number that you can possibly, your life, is, your life is too short. And the number of the external factors is innumerable. And the, even the external factors which are meant to be conducive, they, are also, they also become unconducive. Right? For example, say when you're you, by yourself, you say that I'm very lonely. And when you're with other people, you say that I have no privacy. So this is, look, external factors, there's no third choice. There's no third choice with external factors. So therefore, if you blame external factors, and if it helps you, do it. 
But the reality is that it doesn't help us. It only see, invigorates the problems. So now the wiser thing to do is, of the ex external, impossible to get it all the ex external factors. Now, internal, we have never thought about it. And how long have you been living in this samsara? Since time, since time immemorial till today, we lived in this, in this home, samsari home. Right? And then how successful have you been to get rid of the miseries? Never successful. It's all because we've been pointing to external factors all the time. Right? There's nothing wrong in pointing your finger to external factors, but we have never attempted to point your finger to internal factor and attempt to get into the internal factors. We have never attempted this. Now it is the time for us to revolutionize that thinking. To revolutionize that thinking, instead of pointing your finger to external, just see the this you have tried. External factor, you have tried to get into the external factors, blame the external factors, try to get into the external factors. We have never been successful thus far. Now, it is time for us to rethink and go for the option, second option, to think of the internal factor. What is the internal factor and whether or not I can get rid of this? If I can get rid of this, fine. You remove the internal factor, external factor, however numerous, however ferocious, sound stops. Sound of the misery stops. So the purpose purpose of the spirituality, purpose of the dharma, and more precisely, the purpose of the Buddha's teaching is to, to let us identify, let us be very realistic, let us be very practical to identify the internal factors and to give us, give us options to get rid of the internal factors. Thus, even when the external factors are there, however ferocious, however strong they are, your misery, the sound of the misery stops. That is the wise, the meaning of be wisely kind to yourself. Be wisely kind to yourself, right? Of the two factors, external, internal factor, external, we have been, enough is enough now. We have already blamed the external factors since time immemorial till today. Since time we were born till today. Right? Day one we were born, how many you cried? Day one we were born, how many you cried? Almost everyone we cried, day one we were born, right? Why, why did you cry? My body is weak or I'm not getting milk? <laughs> right? Again, day one we were born, we have been looking for external factors, blame the external factors. This person is not giving me the milk. <laughs> right? You don't say that my body is so weak. My body is so weak that you know, I cannot survive without the milk. Nobody, nobody, no, no child cried like this. This is how we started alive. And yet we totally failed in an endeavor. Now it is high time for us to revolutionize thinking and to see how. Okay, what about the internal factor? Thus far, I've never thought about it. Internal factor, identify this and see whether I can, be, I can get rid of this. And the answer is yes. This is in terms of the, say, in terms of time, in terms of the energy, it requires much, much, much less time, much, much less energy, and the effective, effectiveness is so, so efficacious. Right? So that is the meaning of be wisely kind to yourself. Okay, with that in mind, um, stanza two it reads, whatever degenerations, degenerations there are in the world, the root of all these is ignorance. You're taught that it is dependent origination, the seeing which will undo this ignorance. So knowing that the internal factor, what is this internal factor? Internal factor is two. Self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude. And precisely to get rid of samsara, self-grasping ignorance. Precisely to get rid of the fears is a self-grasping ignorance which is the root of all the suffering. So it says that whatever degenerations there are in the world, the root of all these is self-grasping ignorance. The line, second line says, the root of all these is ignorance. Ignorance is referring to self-grasping ignorance. You taught that it is dependent origination. Now to get rid of this ignorance, what should we do? How to counteract this ignorance? It is by introducing the counter force. You're getting it? It is by introducing counter force. So therefore, ignorance, without getting rid of the ignorance, there's no way by which we can get out of samsara. There's no way by, we can, by which we can stop the sound of a clap. Okay, sound of a clap of samsara.
so now ignorance must be gone right off. For that matter, I'm so, so happy that the, the ABC has organized this teaching and then the, the TBC after the, say, the, the next two days. So there, the, we are focusing on the emptiness. We are so focused on the wisdom, which is so precious, so precious, right? Why I'm saying this is that, is that for example, let's say, the say the internal factor, what we have discovered now is the all the contaminated karmas which we accumulated. And the karmas given rise to by all the afflictions which we generated. And the afflictions, all these gross afflictions, which are all triggered by the self-grasping ignorance which we which we are so addicted to. Right? So these are the internal factors. And the internal factors you may think that they are Innumerable inter, inter factors. No, make it very simple. Self grasping ignorance, the root, right? Say the poisonous leaves are there. Poisonous leaves are growing there, and through the wind, blow, the wind blowing through the poisonous leaves, and skin rashes are created. So then you blame the poisonous leaves. That's fine. And then the unwise people will try to remove the poisonous leaves one by one, right? By the time you remove 50 leaves, the next day, the, after one week, another the 500 leaves will grow. This is very unwise. So the wise people, wise people will uproot the tree. You uproot the tree, and however millions of poisonous leaves they are growing on the tree, they will all dry on their own. You agree with me or not? Yes. So the self-grasping ignorance, you terminate this, the root of all the miseries, then all the afflictions, branches, attachment, anger, jealousy, the fear, anxiety, stress, tension, and then the contaminated karmas, 10 non-virtuous actions, so forth, they will all come to and then the miseries, sickness, aging, death, tension, all will dry automatically if you get rid of the self-grasping ignorance. So how to get rid of the self-grasping ignorance? Self-grasping ignorance, as during the, at the time of the setting proper motivation, self-grasping ignorance is like the darkness. In dark, you don't see what is around you. Likewise, with the ignorance, you don't see the reality. So how to get rid of the darkness? It is only through introducing the light. You agree with me or not? It is only through introducing the light that the darkness can be eradicated. Say, for example, so there's a, there's certain, uh, suddenly there's a power cut and you want to read the text and, and you cannot read it. There's no light there. And then you pray, Buddha, please remove the darkness. Buddha, please remove the darkness. If the Buddha is sitting next to you, right? Buddha will be feeling so un unhappy. Such a hopeless follower. <laughs> Such hopeless follower, right? Just light a candle. You don't need to Buddha, right? Light a candle. <laughs> Whereas if you light a candle, right? Even, if, even though you don't pray to Buddha, but if you light a candle, Buddha will be very happy. This is a person who can, who can really understand my teachings, right? So this is how. To remove the darkness, we need to introduce the light, right? Likewise, to remove the darkness of the ignorance, we have to introduce the light of the wisdom. What's the next question? What is that wisdom? The wisdom, as we said earlier, is the discerning mind whose apprehension of the object tallies with the reality. What's the next question? What's the reality? You're getting it? Okay. So for the reality, Har Sutra says, form is empty. What is the next line? Emptiness is form. What is the next line? Form is not other than emptiness. Emptiness not other than form. Okay, so this is the, the reality. With this, I'm good because there is like a crash course. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so those of us who are beginners, you may be wondering, where is he taking us, right? I'm very sorry. Yeah, those of you who are a little familiar, for you it's fine. But then the, the beginners, he's saying something here, something there. Okay, I'm very sorry. Okay, so the point is that, what's the reality? Form is empty, emptiness of form. Emptiness is not other than form, form is other than emptiness. It's a matter of translation. Some people translate, form is not other than emptiness, emptiness is not other than form. That's fine. Okay, so there, I'm going to rush through this. Form is empty. What is form is empty, right? Okay, what is form is empty? Without understanding this, all the stanzas, following stanzas will make no sense. Without understanding the form is empty, we will not understand all these following stanzas. For that matter, we have to discuss a little bit on this, the form is empty. Okay, 
So what we do is Okay, this is a physical form. What is this? Flower. Flower. It is a form or sound? Form. This is a form. All right, right? This is a form. Okay, form or a mind? What is this? Form or a mind? Form. Okay, form. Okay, let's say that, okay, now I'm, I'm really going through, say, the technicalities. Those, the, say, those who are more beginners, beginners, right? So what you do is just pay attention to what I'm, I'm saying at the very present moment. You're getting it? Present moment? And then I'll try my best to make, to simplify things while at the same time going to the, the, the depth very fast. Right? Okay. I'll say this is form. What am I doing? Drinking what? Okay. You said drinking water. Nobody said drinking H2O. <laughs> Nobody said you are drinking electrons, protons, neutrons. Tell me. What am I drinking? Is that H2O? Yes. yes. What am I doing? Is that electrons, protons, neutrons? Huh? Yes. Hey, louder. Yes. Very good. While while all these three are correct, all these three the answers are correct, that you are doing water, that you are doing H2O, that you are doing electrons, protons, neutrons, while all these three answers are correct, but the answer that you gave is only the first one. You're getting it? You're drinking water. This is the answer that you gave. While all the three answers are correct. Okay, imagine... Tell me, when will you see me drinking electrons and protons and neutrons? Hey, if you say that this is correct, how many you say that this is the correct answer, that I'm drinking, what I'm drinking is electrons, protons, and neutrons? Raise your hands, those who said the answer is correct. Raise your hands, full, not half. <laughs> okay, if this is a correct answer, if this is a correct answer, when will you, we just create a scenario as to when you will see me drinking electrons, protons, and neutrons, tell me. If you, look at, if you look at me, what I'm drinking, through an electron microscope, you will see that I'm drinking electrons, protons, and neutrons. And will you see that I'm drinking water? If you look at through an electron microscope? No. You're getting it? Okay, no. Now, okay, this is where you have to pay a little bit of attention. You're getting it? Say, pertaining to the water, pertaining to the water, with your naked eyes, you are seeing me drinking water? Yes. With electron microscope, you are seeing me drinking water? Okay, louder. No. Okay. You said no. Right? Okay. If you say that I'm with electron microscope, you are not seeing me drinking water, then what are you seeing me doing, drinking? Electrons, protons, neutrons, but not water. Now, pertaining to the water, only with your naked eyes you will see that I'm drinking water. With the electron microscope, you, you see that I'm not drinking water. I'm drinking electrons, protons, neutrons. You're getting it? With the electron microscope, you see that the water is not there. With the naked eyes, you see the water. You're getting it? Okay. Now, tell me. Say, now with this, Group A looks at it with the naked eyes. Group B looks at it with your electron microscope. Group A, what do you see? Flower, form. Group A, what do you see? What, what about the flower? Group A, group B. What, do you, what about the flower? The flower disappears. Flower is empty. You are just seeing electrons, protons, neutrons. You're getting it? When you see electrons, protons, neutrons, you don't see the flower. You're getting it? You agree with me? Okay. When you are distant, you see the forest. When you're inside the forest, you don't see the forest, you see the individual trees. Right? Likewise, when you go through an electron microscope, you see the electrons, protons. You don't see the flower. So what about the flower? The flower is not there, group B. What about the flower? Flower disappears, the flower is empty. Group A, what is this? Flower. Group B, what is this? Flower is empty. You're getting it? Okay. Which of the two perceptions is correct? Tell me. Huh? <laughs> One says there's a flower, other says there's no flower. This is so contradictory. 
right? Okay, group A says that this is yellow flower. Yellow. And group B says this is blue flower. Which is correct? Yellow. yellow. The one who said this is not, not yellow is wrong, right? Likewise, the group A says this is a flower. Group B says this is non-flower. Empty of flower, right? Which of the two persons is correct? Yellow. These two are contradictory. <laughs> okay, you will say never mind. <laughs> never mind, although these two are contradictory, but both are correct. How, how can these both be correct? How can these both be correct? With a very simple example, with a very simple example, okay, let's say Lillian, right? Lillian Chu. Okay. Lillian Chu. Lillian. Lillian. Lillian Chu. Okay. Lillian Chu, what is your mother's name? Ben Yo. Okay, let's say Ben Yo. Ben Yo's mother or daughter? Huh? Mother. Mother. Not daughter. Okay. With respect to Lian Chu, Ben Yo is a mother, not a daughter. With respect to the Lian Chu's grandmother, Ben Yo is a daughter, not a mother. You're getting it? So seeing the Ben Yo as mother as well as daughter, there's no contradiction. Although with respect to Lian Chu, with respect to Lian Chu, seeing that lady as a mother as well as daughter is contradictory. But with two frames of reference, two perceptions cannot, may not be contradictory. Likewise, group A sees this as a form, group B sees this emptiness of form, there's no contradiction because you two, you, you two use two different frames of reference. You getting it? Okay, so group A, group A, the frame of reference that group A use is known as technically known as conventional analysis. Whereas the group analysis, the group B, you, the frame of reference which the group B uses, electron microscope is known as ultimate analysis. You're getting it? Okay, now this object, this object is a flower with respect to conventional analysis. This, respect, this, this object is an emptiness of flower with respect to the Ultimate analysis, you're getting it? Okay, now, how many of you want your stress? How many of you had the experience of stress in your life? Yes. Oh, as well as you have not heard about stress. <laughs> okay, just raise your hands. Okay, now tell me, raise your hands those who do not want stress. Very good, okay. What happened to this flower when you subject this flower to ultimate analysis? What happened to this flower? The flower disappeared. And you want to have your stre stress disappeared? Yeah. Raise your hands. <laughs> okay. If you want to have your stress disappear, then you subject the stress to ultimate analysis. Stress, subject the stress, learn how, learn is not easy. Learn how to subject the stress to ultimate analysis. The stress will disappear. Right? Just as you said form is empty, you will say the stress is empty. You're getting it? Stress is empty. Tension is empty. You can literally feel, you can literally feel that the stress disappears. If you learn how to subject the stress to ultimate analysis. You're getting it? Okay. So with this, with this, the point is, okay, now... <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, number three. So how can an intelligent person not comprehend that this path of dependent origination is the essential point of your teaching? So this is very precious. So now, to see that finally, what is the purpose of life? What we said is that, to get rid of all our miseries, to get rid of all our fears. You agree with me? You agree with me? To get rid of all our fears. Now, to get rid of all our fears, what have we learned today? How to get rid of all the fears? Just say this. How to get rid of the fears? By subjecting the fears to? Ultimate analysis. You're getting it? This is what you have learned. Don't forget it. How to get rid of the fears is by learning how to subject the fears to ultimate analysis. The moment you subject the fear to ultimate analysis, the fear disappears. You experience the dissolution of the fear, the freedom from the fear. 
right? The cessation of the fear. What is the third noble truth? Four noble truths. What is the third one? The truth of the cessation of suffering at its causes. Cessation. To bring an end to the suffering. How does the suffering come to an end? In what sense? How? It's through subjecting the suffering to ultimate analysis. So this is what we have to learn. This is what we have to learn. This is something sub to subject this suffering to ultimate analysis. This was something which on this earth only the Buddha taught. No one ever taught this before the Buddha Shakyamuni. Right? All the teachers before Buddha Shakyamuni, what they taught was that with a, if you subject something to ultimate analysis, that object will not disappear. That object will be most solidly defined. Whereas the Buddha said, that's not true. Just as this flower, when subject to ultimate analysis or the electron microscope, the flower disappears. Likewise, all the stress will disappear if you subject them to ultimate analysis. So what is the job? What is the, the internal factor? Internal factor is the self-grasping ignorance. Ignorance, we see the flower as, okay, okay, let's see. So now this is, so during the Bodhicitta retreats, last time where? Chanting, right? For the Bodhicitta retreats, we do this in more detail. So here, <laughs> All right, so we have to do a little fast. I'm very sorry, particularly for those people who are beginners, right? Okay, so let's say that the, okay, same. Um, okay, same. This flower, this flower, this object, this object. When group A looks at it through naked eyes, you see the, this as flower. Okay, now look at this flower. Look at this flower. Okay, don't forget how this flower appeared to you. How many of you have watched movie in a movie theater? Okay, imagine that you're watching a movie in a movie theater now. Imagine that you're watching a movie in a movie theater. Where is the movie? Where is the movie? On the screen. The movie is on the screen. Where is the movie coming from? <laughs> projector. Where is the projector? Do you hear or there? <laughs> Some say behind like this. Okay, it's behind you. The movie projector is behind you. You're getting it? Although the movie is on the screen, but it's not from the screen. It's from the projector. You agree with me? Good. Likewise. Likewise, so the, the, the screen is analogy for the object that you're watching. And the movie projector is the analogy for subject, the mind. You're getting it? The screen is analogy for the object. And the, the movie projector is analogy, for, analogy of the subject, your mind. Just as the movie is, although the movie is on the screen, but it's not from the screen. From the, from the screen, the movie is empty. If the movie is empty from the screen, where the, where the movie is coming from? It's coming from the projector. It's not from the screen. It's from the opposite side, projector. You're getting it? Likewise, likewise, where is? When you look at the movie, when you watch the movie, where do you see the movie coming from? Particularly if you are age five or age six. Age five or age six, you're watching a movie. You see the movie coming from where? Coming from the screen, and if it's a ghost movie, <laughs> then you feel so scared, you will just cover your face from the screen, right? Thinking that the movie is coming from the screen. Okay, screen is analogy to the object. Movie projector is analogy of the subject. So the movie is coming from the object or coming from the subject? Very good. The movie is coming from the subject. If the movie is coming from the subject, then movie is, movie is from the object? Is movie is from the object or not? No, then what is from the object? Nothing. So the movie that you're watching is purely coming from the subject, from the movie projector. So that is known as the movie is subjectively existent. It's not, it's empty of objective existence. The movie does not exist objectively. The movie exists subjectively. So the yesterday's question, what is emptiness? What is emptiness? Emptiness is that things are empty of objective existence. Things don't exist from the object, things exist from the 
subject, right? Things exist from the subject, they don't exist from the object. Don't, don't and empty mean the same. Things don't exist from the object, things are empty of objective existence. You're getting it? This is the meaning of, this is understanding of emptiness. Now with this, what we have to know is that everything exists from the, everything exists from the, from the subject. Nothing exists from the object. Okay, let's say that we are dreaming. And tell me, the dream exists objectively or subjectively? Objective. Say you dream of a ghost chasing you. you. Dream of a ghost chasing you. So that dream ghost exists subjectively or objectively? Subjective. Huh? Subjective. Subjectively, very good. And if you're in the dream, if you're in the dream, if you're still in the dream, you see the dream goes as subjectively real or objectively real? Objectively, objectively real. You're getting it? Okay. Seeing the dream as objectively real, is that ignorance or that is wisdom? Ignorance. ignorance. And the outcome of this ignorance is the fear in the dream. Right? The moment you wake up, the moment you wake up, say the dream, is, the, the dream goes is about the, coming to catch you. Right? And about to grab at you. And the moment, and sometimes you, we, we, we fall, and we, when we fall, the particular somebody is chasing you, it's so difficult to get up, right? You had that experience? Okay, so we, you find it so difficult to get up, and the, the, the ghost does not compromise. The ghost, <laughs> yeah, the ghost conti continues to chase you, the ghost continues to chase you, and then you're about to get there, then what is your feeling? Now I'm dead, I'm done. So when you say, I'm done, your mother makes you, makes you up, the mother wakes you up. What's your feeling? Relief. A great relief. Okay. Why did you have relief when your mother wakes you up? Uh, to know that the dream ghost was not real. The dream ghost was not real. So knowing the dream ghost is not real. The, knowing the dream ghost is subjectively real. Not objectively real. Objectively empty. Knowing the dream ghost is subjectively real. Objectively empty. That is wisdom or ignorance. Wisdom. So that realization happens in the dream or outside the dream? Outside the dream. So therefore, to get this realization, we have to come out of the dream. We have to wake up. It's for this reason that the Buddha Shakyamuni is referred to, one of the epithets of the Buddha Shakyamuni is that he's referred to as the fully awakened one. He's referred to as the fully awakened one. You're getting it? Fully awakened one. So therefore, we have to wake up from the sleep of ignorance because in the dream, what happens? You see the dream goes as real ghost, as objectively real ghost. And what is the, the effect? What is the, the outcome? Fear. And you want fear? No. If you don't want fear, what should you do? Wake up. By waking up, you will get the wisdom to know that the dream goes is not subject is object real, it is all subject real. Once you get this, you see that dream goes is empty of objective existence. Knowing this, this is known as wisdom. And what is the benefit of this wisdom? Your fear dissolves. Right? Your fear dissolves. Okay, so therefore, to cultivate wisdom, the fear dissolves. You have the ignorance, seeing the dream goes is real, the fear increases. And what do you want? Fear increases or fear dissolving? Fear dissolving. For that matter, we have to cultivate the wisdom. Okay, stanza three. So how can an intelligent person not comprehend that this part of dependent origination, this part of the emptiness, dependent origination, is the essential point of your teaching? So finally, what for the Buddha Shakyamuni appear on this earth? There's something which is so unique. It is for two reasons. One is to wake up to wake us up from the sleep of ignorance. Because till Buddha Shakyamuni, there was no teacher who taught that, who taught that things are all subject real, nothing exists objectively. It was only the Buddha Shakyamuni who appeared on this earth to teach that, the first teacher who taught that things are all empty of objective existence, things are all like dream. Okay, so this emptiness, this emptiness concept, this emptiness, so what it here, the Lama Tsongkhapa, what he said here is always about dependent origination. And what I'm talking about is all about the emptiness. So 
So there is a little gap, discrepancy between the two. That what I'm teaching is emptiness all the time to get rid of fear. And Lama Tsongkhapa was talking about the dependent notion all the time. What's the, there's a discrepancy in the air. So how to dissolve this discrepancy? This is so important. Okay. So we'll do this part. Um, I'll say emptiness, emptiness which we are studying, which we emphasize so much here. And then what Lama Tsongkhapa is emphasizing so much is dependent origination. These, are, these two are the two sides of the same coin. These are the two sides of the same coin, right? Okay, so for that matter, many people, they misinterpret emptiness to mean nothingness. In fact, I know that there are many, even the professors, professors who claim to be great Buddhist philosophy professors. And then what they say is, in Buddhism, nothing's there. Buddhism talks about anatta, selflessness, emptiness, nothing's there. This is a total misconception of the Buddhist philosophy, right? If you really want to understand the real concept of emptiness, the way the Buddhist Shakyamuni taught, we have to understand emptiness in the light of dependent origination. We have to know that these two are the, these two, are the two sides of the same coin. Okay, for that matter, for that matter, what we need to know is Depend, emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness means dependent origination, number one. Number two, dependent origination means the middle way. Number three, therefore emptiness means the middle way. You getting it? Oh, number one, emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness means the dependent origination, number one. Number two, dependent origination means the middle way. Number three, therefore emptiness means the middle way. Right? So this we will do, and then we'll stop here. Okay, first, emptiness means dependent origination. How? How? How does emptiness mean, how does emptiness mean dependent origination? Emptiness, for that we have to know five points. We have to know five points. Number one, emptiness. Number two, emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. You're getting it? Okay. How many of you, how many of you know the, uh, how many of you know, what is that? HTB? Huh? How many HTB? We all know. Right? I learned this from Nick yesterday, <laughs> two days ago. Okay, how many of you know who? How many of you know who? Who are you? Huh? It's amazing. So you are not confused between the WHO and who? Who are you? Right? You are not confused between the two. Okay, say who? Who doesn't mean who are you? Who is a short form of world health organization. Likewise, emptiness does not mean nothingness, emptiness. Emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. You're getting it? So number one, emptiness. Number two, emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Number two. Number three, emptiness of independent existence means nothing exists independently. Number three, nothing exists independently. Nothing exists independently means everything exists by Hey, nothing exists independently means everything exists by dependence. Very good. Number four. If everything exists by dependence, everything is dependently originated. Number five. Let me say this again. Number one is emptiness. What is number two? Emptiness is short form of emptiness of independent existence. Okay. Emptiness of independent existence means number three. Nothing exists independently. Number three. Nothing exists independently means, number four, everything exists by dependence, number four. <clears throat> if everything exists by dependence, everything is dependently originated. So with these five points, we come to realize that emptiness means dependent origination. You're getting it? Good. What is the second part? Hey, <laughs> what is the second part? Dependent origination means the middle way, right? Okay, dependent origination means the middle way. The first one is how emptiness means dependent origination. That is done. Second one, dependent origination means the middle way. How is dependent origination means that, how is dependent origination middle way? Dependent origination has two sides. Two sides, dependence and origination. 
dependence and origination. Dependence, what's the opposite of dependence? Independence. So independence, absolute, they mean the same. So when you say dependence, it rejects absolutism. It rejects the extreme of independence. It rejects the extreme of absolutism. Dependence. What is the other one? Origination. When you say origination, origination means something comes to the origination. Something comes to the existence. What's the opposite of existence? Non-existence or nihilism. So by origination, it rejects nihilism. In the, the dependence, it rejects the absolutism. Origination, it rejects the nihilism. Bringing dependent, dependent origination together rejects the two extremes. Rejecting the two extremes is following the middle way. You're getting it? This is how dependent origination means the middle way. So now, combining these two things, these two sets together, we come to realize that emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness is the middle way. You getting it? This is what we have to know. Once we know this, then you see that finally understanding emptiness, understanding dependent origination will automatically lead you to understand emptiness. You understand emptiness, it will automatically lead you to understand dependent origination. These two should be mutually enhancing in your experience. Okay, so with this, Number three again, so how can an intelligent person not comprehend that this part of dependent origination is essential point of your teaching, dependent origination, emptiness, this is the final essential point of the Buddha's teaching, right? Okay, so this understanding of emptiness is not something that you have to believe in. While all our purpose, the purpose for everyone, whether you're Buddhist or non-Buddhist, for everyone, the purpose is to dismantle their miseries of the life, dismantle their stress and anxiety of the life. And to remove the stress and the anxiety of the life, how, what we have learned today, subject them to ultimate analysis. Subject the miseries that we go through to the ultimate analysis. Learn how to subject the, the miseries to the ultimate analysis. Okay. Then, how to bring this to ultimate analysis? By understanding dependent origination. You understand dependent origination, this will automatically let you to cultivate the ultimate analysis. This will see the emptiness of the miseries that we go through. So this, we don't have to believe in it. This is something which we can rationally come to realize. Rationally, logically we come to realize. This is how, if somebody who is intelligent, intelligent person, seeing this will just see the wonder. And who taught this? The Buddha Shakyamuni, on this earth, he taught this for the first time, right? And all the intelligent people, intelligent people, how come that the intelligent people do not understand this? How come that there are intelligent people who do not appreciate the Buddha's teachings of how to dismantle our miseries? So this is what I said here. So how can an intelligent person not comprehend that this part of dependent origination is the essential point of your teaching? This being so, who will find O oh, Savior? Savior means the Buddha, a more wonderful way to praise you than to praise you for having taught this origination through dependence. Whatsoever, so what is this dependent origination? Now explaining, whatsoever depends on conditions that is devoid of intrinsic existence. Dependent origination means emptiness, devoid of intrinsic existence. Devoid of intrinsic existence, objective existence, independent existence, they all mean the same. So, dependent origination means the emptiness. This devoid, devoid meaning empty, empty of intrinsic existence. What excellent instruction can they be more amazing than this proclamation? So finally what I want is I want all suffering to disappear, all suffering to dissolve. And how to dissolve all the suffering? By learning how to subject the suffering to ultimate analysis. And Subjecting the, the, the suffering to ultimate analysis, this I don't have to believe, I don't have to have a blind faith. This is what I can logically understand. So it is for this reason that, that the, what excellent instruction can there be more amazing than this proclamation. By grasping at it, the child is strengthened the bondage on extreme views. Okay, now dependent origination. From what we have learned, is by understanding dependent origination, it takes us to understand emptiness. Whereas, those people who do, who do not understand the Buddha's teaching so thoroughly, 
So for them, dependent origination means there's something objective there, right? There's something objective independently there. So this is, for example, say the medicine. Medicine is to quell, is to quell our problems. And yet, yet in some cases, medicine can become the poison. You agree with me? Your doctor is there, right? In some cases, if we, what is overdose? Overdose means what? The medicine becomes poison, right? So the medicine is meant to remove the illness, but if you overdose, the medicine can become poison. You're getting it? So likewise, say, although dependent origin is for the wise people, dependent origination will lead to understand emptiness. This understand emptiness will dissolve all your miseries. Miseries, but for those who are not wise, who do not understand the Buddha's teaching so well, for them, dependent on origination, instead of taking them to understand emptiness, they will have the misunderstanding of things to be independently real, things to be objective real, things to be solidified, and therefore the, the grasping increases. With the grasping increases, the misery increases. If you see the dream goes as Grasping the dream goes is so real. The more you see it as real, the more the fear will arise. So this is how the childish beings do. By gra number six, by grasping at it, the childish. Gra by grasping at it, it refers to the dependent origination. By grasping at dependent origination, the childish, who do not understand emptiness well, strengthen the bondage to extreme views. Strengthen the bond bondage to the extreme views. What? Extreme of Extreme of eternalism, extreme of absolutism, extreme of independent existence. Extreme views for the wise, whereas by, for the wise, this very fact, this very fact of dependent origination, this very fact of dependent origination is the doorway to cut free from the net of elaboration. What is elaboration? Elaboration of self-grasping ignorance. This elaboration is the elaboration of self-grasping ignorance. Okay, number seven. Since this teaching is not seen elsewhere, you alone are the teacher. The Buddha Shakyamuni, after, say the, after leaving the palace, then for the next six years, he was going in search of a teacher. And he met two teachers, Acharya Alarakalam and Acharya Udreka, the two teachers. And both the two teachers, the, the two teachers, they failed to give him the satisfactory answers or satisfactory teachings. So he went in search of the, the path, and finally he got this path of the wisdom of emptiness and wisdom of dependent origination. So this teaching on this earth, historically speaking, on this earth, okay, some of you may debate with me, right? If we have more time, that would be wonderful to go into detail. On this earth, when I speak of on this earth, there are two ways of understanding. One is historically speaking. Historically speaking, and number two, in terms of the Mahayana's unique presentation. Historically speaking, Buddha Shakyamuni was the first, first being on this earth to teach emptiness. Whereas according to the Mahayana's unique presentation, Buddha Shakyamuni himself, he learned this from somebody else. Not in this life. Not in this life. He, this life, he was already the Buddha, according to the Mahayana Buddha, the unique presentation. But what we are discussing here is about the historic, according to the historical account. According to the historical account, on this earth, Bodhisattva was the first one who brought this teaching. So it says, number seven, since this teaching is not seen elsewhere, according to the historical account, you alone, you the Buddha Shakyamuni, you alone are the teacher. Teacher meaning the teacher of the excellent, teacher of the path which liberates the beings from suffering. Like calling a fox a lion for a tirtika. Tirtika meaning those teachers who were contemporary, those teachers who were contemporary with Buddha Shakyamuni, who do not, who do not, who do not know what emptiness is. For them, it is like although people revere them as teachers, but in actuality, it was like a word of flattery. Stanza 8, wondrous teacher, referring to Buddha Shankamani, wondrous teacher, wondrous refuge. Wondrous teacher means the teacher who could teach the emptiness so precisely. Wondrous refuge, because, because of his having taught emptiness, we are given the refuge, refuge of freedom from suffering. Wondrous speaker, 
So how the Buddha Shakyamuni presented this emptiness concept, which was never taught till that point, till the Buddha Shakyamuni, Prince Siddhartha became Buddha. So therefore, the, how he spoke was so precise and so succinct that he became a wonderful speaker, wonderful savior. He saved us because of this teaching. He alone is able to save us from this samsara. I pay homage to that teacher who taught well, dependent origination. Okay, so we'll stop here. Any questions? One or two questions? One or two questions? Okay, one over there at the end. <clears throat> no, I can't do anything. Yeah, this is a crash course. I already said it. Yes, Einstein. Isaac. Yes? Question? Okay, would you mind coming a little closer? Somehow I just, there's an echo, the echo there. Uh, so the according to the two sentences earlier, if you have no suffering, there's no need to practice Dharma, and the Dharma addresses suffering. Can I also say that if being a Dharma practitioner, the suffering is not ceased, then, then the practice is not the right path? If the suffering is not ceased, yes. then the practice is not on proper path. Then, then perhaps um, it's not practicing about. Okay. So the, this is a good question. Did you all follow the question? So what we said is that if there's no suffering, why should we practice Dharma, right? So now what you're saying is that for a practitioner, if the suffering is not ceased, then we have not been doing the Dharma in the correct way. Okay. This is good presentation. What I would say is the same. Two, what is two plus two? Two plus two is four. It's very straightforward, right? So there are two things. One is very straightforward and what, one which will take time. So elevating suffering, elevating suffering is not like two plus two equals four, right? You learn emptiness and tomorrow suffering disappears. Instead, instead it is like gade gade, para gade, <laughs> Parasamgate Bodhiswaha. Right? It's not a Gade Bodhiswaha. <laughs> right? So therefore, the, the, this is something which will take time. So as long as the progress is happening, as long as the progress is happening, you are going to do a proper Dharma practice. If the progress is not happening, then we have to reconsider whether what you're doing is, you know, where we're going wrong. Progress must be there. In, even with us, with a daily, you say, you being with, you say, the, any center, ABC, TBC, with your own teachers, whatever. So as long as the progress is happening, this is amazing. You are on a proper track. It's not necessary that tomorrow the, the suffering should end. No. Right? As long as progress should be there. Very good. Maybe last question, if somebody has. Okay. But then we will... Okay, that is good. So one measurement I already told, told you earlier, as you age, <laughs> as you age, you become happier, 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 you don't miss your youth, <laughs> right? You don't miss your, so maybe you are in your 20s, right? If you're in your 20s, you don't miss your, oh, when I was 16, I was cute, <laughs> right? So if you don't miss, you're about the 16 years old, 17, which means that you're a good Dharma practitioner. If you miss, something's wrong. <laughs> okay, we will do the end prayer. Page number 
and blue book 308. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful changes, the Tenzin Gyasu, please remain until samsara ends. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all beings without exception into an enlightened state. Chan Joy Sam Joy Amboche Maya Pan Amke Kyoroche Maya Kon Kondo Pemaraisho May the Supreme Bodhicitta, that is not arisen, arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase forevermore. I dedicate the marriage thus gathered towards the realization, the deeds and the prayers of all the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the three times, and to the upholding of Dharma of teaching and realization. May I in all lives, through the force of this merit, never separate from the four wheels of the Mahana vehicle, and accomplish all the stages of the path, renunciation, Bodhicitta, perfect when the two stages. With a wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind of full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. I go for refuge to the Triple Gem, I confess the negativities individually, I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings, I hold the precious Buddha in my heart. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. The path of union of emptiness and compassion is loosely explained by the portrait of the Dharma in the beings of the snowland. You are the lotus holder, Tenzin Gyatso. We subjugate you that your wishes are fulfilled spontaneously. May the operations of evil thoughts and deeds of the negative forces of humans or non-humans who have managed through perverted prayers against the teachings of the Buddhas be totally vanquished through the path of the truth of the three jewels. Throughout my future lifetimes, may I always be guided by Adam and Jushri and be able to uphold the Dharma in general and the teachings of dependent origination in particular, even in the cosmic life.